evening, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of this traditional territory on which we have gathered here today, the Anishinaabe peoples, the Haudenosaunee peoples, and the Lene Lenape peoples. Please stand for O Canada. Next on our agenda this evening, we have the strategic plan in action. Director Fisher. Superintendent Skinner. Thank you and through the chair. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce the team from Eagle Heights Public School, which is located in London and serves over 1,000 students. As a superintendent of this school, I am very proud of the work that the 109 school staff do each day with all of the students that attend this vibrant school community. I will now turn things over to Ken Overing, principal of Eagle Heights Public School, who will introduce his team and share with you the work that is being done in the area of equity at this school. Thank you, Praveen. Good evening, everyone. I would like to introduce um, our uh, team. So we have Mary Rose, who is the system principal for ESL ELD. We have Jenny Gagne Brown, who is the new vice principal at Eagle Heights. She just started a few weeks ago with us. And we have Aya and Mahi, two of our amazing grade eight students who have joined us tonight as well. Um, um, we had hoped to have our learn teacher, Amber Wallace, with us, as well as our acting vice principal, um, Andrea Santos, unfortunately they weren't able to come and join us tonight, um, but they did contribute, or do contribute significantly to the work. We've been asked to share some of the work that we are doing as our amazing staff has been doing at Eagle Heights under the um, lens of the equity priority. Um, we are very, uh, um, or sorry, we are very fortunate and appreciative of the support that has been offered to our, our school from the system. We have 7.4 ESL teachers on staff um, supporting our English language learners. Our um, ESL teachers um, uh, work in collaboration with our classroom teachers in order to provide programming in classes for the students. And they work directly in the classrooms with the teachers. Um, our ESL teachers in collaboration with our uh, classroom teachers um, are, are proactive and, and help to build vocabulary for our students prior to them embarking in the learning. Um, they also work collaboratively to establish accommodations and modifications in order for our ELLs to access the curriculum and the learning in the classroom. We have worked very hard as a school to invite our families in and help them to understand the school system as well as identify their needs and wishes for their children. We work in collaboration with the Muslim Resource Center, as well as uh, settlement workers in schools, also known as Swiss workers, uh, to provide various workshops for our parents, including navigating various platforms, such as School Messenger and the Parent Portal, as well as understanding report cards, transitions to high schools, um, uh, uh, developing literacy in the home, et cetera. 
Um, in partnership with Mary Rose and the ESL team in Learning Support Services, we have recently met with the Four Cs, which is the Canadian Civic Cultural Club, and we are working on a joint project which will be uh, an open forum meeting with our newcomer families on a Saturday morning as their, um, as their children attend Arabic school at Eagle Heights. Um, Arabic school was moved to Eagle Heights uh, this past September. Um, it was formerly at Weeble, but many of the registrants of the program were from our school community, so we opened our doors in order for them to um, be able to use our facility for Arabic school, and there are now 225 students who attend Arabic school on Saturdays. We have transformed our school council to include a group of 15 people, including newcomer families from various cultures to increase awareness and family voice in our school. This was done by personally inviting families um, to be part of school council and by translating materials to help build understanding. For interview day in November, we had 430 interviews occur over Thursday evening and Friday morning, as well as others that occurred um, before and after school throughout that week and the following week. Seven interpreters were hired through MCIS, which is a, a translation and an interpretation service, and 85 inter interviews occurred using interpreters over those, uh, over those two time slots. Our learning support teachers, ESL teachers, teacher librarians, and classroom teachers have worked very hard to give students access to learning through the use of technology, specifically Read and Write for Google, as well as Google Translate. This has greatly increased access to learning for many of our students with special education needs, ELLs, as well as other students who benefit from access to learning. Um, we, as an admin team, have strategically set up the school to ensure that there, are at least, there is at least one class of each grade inside the, the main building um, for accessibility reasons, so that as students move into our community, we can definitely meet their needs within the main building. We are very fortunate to have two LEARN classes, and LEARN stands for Literacy Enrichment and Academic Readiness for Newcomers. Um, Mary Rose will be speaking about LEARN from the system perspective in just a moment. In our LEARN classes, we are able to provide our ELD students, and that stands for English Literacy Development, and Mary's going to expand on that in a sec, um, with targeted intervention in both literacy and numeracy. This year, our LEARN teacher, as well as two of our ESL teachers, were trained on leveled literacy intervention, and this is now one of, uh, part of the programming in the LEARN class. We have observed great results from the implementation of this program in the LEARN class. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary. Thank you, Ken. So Ken mentioned um, ELD, so that stands for Early Literacy Development, and students that require that program are often our newcomer students that have arrived, um, often from war-torn countries, and they have not had previous experiences in school, or there's a wide gap. So this program is intentionally made to um, provide those services for those students. So the LEARN program supports these newly arrived English language learners with intensive instruction in English as a second language and English literacy development with an emphasis on the English language programs needed for their social and academic purposes. There is intensive support for literacy in reading and writing, as Ken mentioned, using the Leveled Literacy Intervention Program, as well as numeracy to support the achievement of their academic potential. The focus of the LEARN program is to reduce those learning gaps so that these students may experience grade level academic success more quickly. It is also provides that needed support for students as they adjust socially and emotionally to the school environment. Um, sometimes these students too have been exposed to um, experiences of, of trauma, so that support is crucial for them to um, feel safe, welcomed, and develop those key relationships in order that they are more able to learn the academic program that is provided for them. 
So in LEARN, there is the need for collaboration between the classroom and the LEARN classroom teacher. The identified students will participate in the LEARN program for only half the day where they will receive that support in literacy and numeracy. The students then return to their homerooms for the remainder of the day where they will be integrated for regular programming with their same age peers that they often play with in the yard and um, before and after school. So we are really, really fortunate in Thames Valley to have 12 LEARN classes, two at Eagle Heights, um, in eight Thames Valley schools throughout our board. Um, and they are taught by our qualified ESL ELD teachers. We are very fortunate to have a staff that loves working at Eagle Heights with our families and students. We have been able to hire a couple of uh, staff that speak Arabic, as well as one staff member who speaks Spanish. These staff members um, have been helpful with both supporting our staff, as well as our families. Our staff also access Swiss workers on a regular basis to support families, as well as to uh, gain a better understanding of cultural needs and traditions. We have experienced very low staff turnover over the last couple of years. Staff enjoy coming to work and there is a very positive school culture um, uh, within our building, a uh, culture of caring and supporting each other. Lunchroom supervisors have been hired from within our parent community, often giving parents their first job in Canada. Our Strong Star program, which is a program that supports uh, letters, sounds and words for kindergarten and grade one students, and which is um, made possible by volunteers has some of our newcomer mums as volunteers in the program. The only way that these mums were able to volunteer is if we could make uh, or facilitate the training within our school setting. This is not traditionally done, however in partnership with Strong Start, Kelly Corinne and Sherry Shepard, our Strong Start coordinators, were able to make this happen. We now have many more mums asking to volunteer to be part of this program. In order to support the learning and growth for our educational assistant team, we do fluid timetabling so that each of our team members work with uh, various students with various needs. This allows them to grow as well as to know many of our students as well as um, for our students to not become dependent on one or two adults in order to access learning. Aya and Mahi will now sh each share a thought about one thing that they love about being students at Eagle Heights. Come on forward, girls. One of the things I love at Eagle Heights is that it's a very multicultural school. Um, no matter what faith or religion you uh, practice, you're always welcome there and you never feel out of place. One thing I love about Eagle Heights is that it is a school that's willing to accept people with, with special needs and that need more attention to be pushed to work harder and be in the same level as other students so they can have a better future as they get older. Thank you so much for providing us the opportunity to share the exciting work that our amazing staff is doing at Eagle Heights. Mary, Jenny, and I are pleased to take any questions at this point. Thank you so much for uh, sharing the wonderful things that happen each and every day in your school. Uh, Trustee Kitty, do you have a question? Actually, uh, through you, Chair, it's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, Trustee Rahman and I uh, had the opportunity to, to travel with uh, uh, Director Fisher and also uh, Superintendent Skinner to Ken's school, um, I guess it was before Christmas, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, You know, it's, it's really remarkable. And if, um, if you ever get the opportunity as a trustee to go visit Ken's school through, through the superintendents or something, please do so because how your team works with that many students and that diversification uh, of ethnic diversification is remarkable. Can you, I can't tell you how many people I've told about my experiences that day with, with you and with Director Fisher and with Trustee Roman and how much we enjoyed that, uh, that visit. 
but more important than that, how you're able to to do what you do with your team. And it's really quite remarkable, and, and you, I, I, I applaud the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments related to the presentation? Seeing none, thank you very much. For, oh, sorry, Trustee Skinner. Thank you, through you, Chair. I just wanted to thank you, Ken, uh, Mary, Jenny, and I, I don't know if I caught your names correctly, Alia and Mahi. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I just, you know, I wouldn't know where to begin in, in terms of how much information that you've provided for us tonight. Like, I found it very enlightening. Um, but I've always been impressed with you, Ken, I mean, from the, the time that we first met and uh, when you were at Riverside. And, um, you know, when we think about access to education, you think about cult sometimes culture, sometimes language, those can be barriers. Um, but from what I've observed in the, based on this presentation tonight is that um, what you have is community. And I think that's at the root of, of, of everything there. So I really appreciate the positivity uh, that you've infused into the school. And I really look forward to, to seeing what, what comes further from this because I think there's a really great story to tell and I think there's gonna be really great things in the future um, from Eagle Heights. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Seeing no other questions or comments, ditto. <laughs> thank you for joining us this evening. We will move along in our agenda, and just to uh, just let you know that we do have <coughs> uh, Trustee Pizzolatto, who has joined us uh, by the telephone this evening. I will look for a motion to approve the agenda. <coughs> Trustee Cuddy, Trustee Skinner, all in favor? Motion is carried. The official record, uh, Supervisor Williams. <coughs> We regret to record the death of Troy Eldridge on December 26th. Troy was an employee of the Thames Valley District School Board Maintenance Department. We'll observe a moment of silence. Thank you. We'll move along in our agenda. Are there any conflicts of interest to declare? Seeing none, we'll move to director's announcements. Thank you, Chair Morell. It is my honor this evening to announce the retirements of Superintendents Wilkinson and McPherson. After many years of dedicated service, Superintendents Don McPherson and Karen Wilkinson have announced their upcoming retirements. Karen's retirement is effective March 31st, and Don will be at retiring August 31st. Karen started as a superintendent of education in August 2001. She has served as a superintendent of student achievement, also as an executive superintendent of operations. And prior to her appointment, Karen served as a principal, uh, learning supervisor, and had many other roles throughout the district. She had the good fortune and the province had the good fortune of having her as uh, the Ministry of Education seconded Karen for two years where she served as the field team lead for the London West region and worked in the student achievement division. While reporting directly to the deputy minister, Karen worked closely with the ministry and school board staff across the region to provide expertise and support to a team of student achievement officers in their quest to support student achievement. Collectively, they assisted in the areas of literacy and mathematics achievement developed and implemented a menu of student achievement items at a time that was really uh, a progressive period of uh, time in Ontario education. Her breadth and depth of knowledge in student learning, leadership, systemic change has allowed her to provide exceptional leadership during her 36 years of service in education. And she's had many portfolios, has worked throughout the district and uh, has contributed greatly in all of those capacities. In her community, Karen served as the executive board on the Huron University College as chair and vice chair. And during that tenure, she supported strategic planning and the development of contract negotiations and the search for a new president. The Thames Valley District School Board appointed Superintendent Don McPherson to his role in 2013. 
prior to that, Don served many years as a principal and vice principal at five secondary schools, both in rural and urban communities, and served also as a principal and vice principal in summer school for many years. Prior to joining Thames Valley District School Board, he was a secondary school teacher in the City of London, department head in physical education, and also a teacher in Manitoba. As a leader, Don has always encouraged risk-taking and the opportunities to build a community that is open and responsive to the needs of our students. He believes deeply in a distributive leadership model and worked diligently to promote trust through open and transparent communication at all levels of the organization. Don is respected throughout the system by school administrators through whom he has worked over the years. He was also recognized for his outstanding leadership in the Rethink Secondary Learning that was charged with modernizing our teaching practice and program delivery. Don's leadership in capital planning was pivotal, pivotal, specifically during challenging times when the board dealt with attendance area reviews, school consolidations and closures. As a superintendent, Don has been champion, uh, a champion for parent and community engagement in his work with the parent involvement committees and his work closely with community advocates related to developing concussion protocols, supporting medical conditions and the implementation of the revised health and physical education community curriculum. In the community, Don has served as the community education representative on the Western University Senate and volunteered with the Elgin County Leaders Cabinet. Don and Karen's unwavering commitment to the Thames Valley District School Board will be greatly missed. And just on a, on a personal note, I just want to appreciate my, or send my appreciation and gratitude to the support I have received from both Don and Karen as I have transitioned as a newcomer to this district and their institutional knowledge and their uh, understanding of the complexity and the context of the system has been absolutely invaluable in helping me transition to the role. So I hope that everyone will join me in congratulating Karen and, John and Don on their upcoming retirements. Well done. And I too would like to express my gratitude for your leadership. You've never lost sight in terms of what's best for our students and our system, and I thank you for that. And wish you all the best in your retirement, but not quite yet. <laughs> Next on our agenda, Chair's announcements. I have two announcements this evening. I would like to begin by congratulating Trustee Smith and Trustee Ruddock on their uh, Citizen of the Year uh, through the Elmer Express. <laughs> congratulations, uh, very exciting. And I would like to express my congratulations to Trustee Yeoman. They've welcomed a new grandbaby, so congratulations on the new grandbaby. Move along in our agenda uh, this evening. There is no public input. We'll look towards agenda item number 10, minutes of the uh, December 17th meeting of 2019. I will look for a motion to confirm the minutes of December 2019. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Trustee Ruddock and Trustee Cuddy. All in favor? Moved. Is there any business arising from the minutes of the December 2017th meeting? Sorry, the December 17th meeting. Seeing none, thank you. Student trustee update moving along on our agenda. Who will begin this evening? Trustee Chung, go ahead. Through the chair, last weekend I had the pleasure of attending the Ontario Public School Boards Association's Public Education Symposium through my position with the Ontario Student Trustees Association, where I was able to connect with 15 other student trustees across the province. We had a great discussion about student advisory councils, student trustee initiatives, and modern changes to the education system. The student trustees have been preparing to attend the Ontario Student Trustees Association's Board Council Conference in Ottawa, Ontario. We are incredibly excited for the professional development and the awesome ideas we can share with student trustees across Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, and through the chair. Our, roast, our most recent uh, Student Advisory Council meeting took place on January 14th. My fellow student trustees and I facilitated a brainstorming session on mental health initiatives in schools and discussed why these conversations are important as well as what we can do to improve them. This is all in preparation for our Student Advisory Council meeting next month with Kelly Appleby, which is the Thames Valley Mental Health Lead. 
As well, we debriefed on our student leadership conference that was held in November and discussed the upcoming student trustee elections. We have been working with our student senators on a social media campaign that will hopefully educate and encourage students from across the board to run for the position of student trustee and indigenous student trustee. Thank you for your report. Are there any questions related to the report from the student trustees? Seeing none, we'll move along in our agenda to reports from administration. Begin with Director of Education Entry Plan, Director Fisher. Thank you, Chair Morrell. Uh, I'm coming up to the six month mark into the new role and I thought it would be uh, wise to bring to the Board of Trustees an update on my entry plan and uh, progress to date. So really the purpose of the presentation this evening and really as I transitioned into the new role was to try to gain an understanding of the history, context, and depth of the Thames Valley District School Board, to identify and understand what opportunities would present to us as a board, what challenges we faced as a district, and what best practices we could implement related to improving student achievement and well-being. In order to do this, I wanted to establish positive working relationships with the senior team, with trustees, with our employee groups, our greater community, and the staff that work for the district. It was very important for me to try to build strong relationships with our trustees to support their roles and their responsibilities in terms of moving our collective work forward. Also, I've taken this time to try to assess the effectiveness of our senior team structure with a focus on accountability for results and leadership as outlined by the Ontario Leadership Framework. So during the early phases of my entry plan, I used some guiding principles in my work and conversations. I wanted to honor the strategic priorities that had been developed by the board, achievement, well-being, equity, diversity, and relationships. I was committed to enga engaging in open discussions, being open to feedback, trying to be transparent and timely in conversations with our staff, trustees, and communities, and make a commitment that all the decisions we would make moving forward would be based on data and research, and the interventions that we would put in place would be evidence-informed, and I was committed to respecting the work that had been accomplished already in the district and using that as a foundation to build on best practices moving forward. So the first thing I really wanted to do was engage in uh, extensive stakeholder consultations. And you can see, I won't read the entire list there, but it was very important for me to really go cast a wide net in terms of the people that I was talking to and asking them about what they needed from me as a new director, what I needed to know about the district, and what suggestions that they had for me in terms of moving forward. One of the things I, I did before I even started in the role was talked to a number of other directors across the province and ask for advice on what they thought would be really an outstanding book of leadership that could ground the way we wanted to interact as a district. And we landed on the culture code, which I have talked about many times, and that's really around how do you build cultures of safety amongst your team so that people can express their vulnerability because if people don't express their vulnerability, you'll never get to really understanding what barriers are in the way of progress. And then collectively, how do we set a direction forward? And we consistently and constantly revisit the themes out of this book. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, we have multiple copies available for, for lending in the district. And so that was one of the things that I did to establish early on. What was really clear through all of my initial stakeholder consultations and those uh, initial meetings was that they wanted a director that was transparent, open, and accessible. So I made social media a real priority. I've been very, very active on social media and Twitter uh, and have started, I think I had a r roughly around 600 followers when I started in the role. And by latest count, we are now over 2,000. And so that's, I think, just an, a fantastic opportunity to share all of the great things that are actually happening in all areas of the district. One of the things I'm really proud of is our bi-weekly strategic priorities in action where we have an opportunity to consolidate really good things from across the district and once again celebrate all the really fantastic things that are happening. And then really trying to end each of our board meetings with this director's news from the system to once again take opportunities like we saw with Eagle Heights today to really celebrate and build on all those fantastic things that are happening in all areas of the district. 
I've also been committed to visiting our schools and, and learning about our schools and you can see my commitment is if possible to try to visit every school within the first two years that I ha have this position and I'm well on my way uh, to do that. I try to get out to schools every week. Uh, to multiple schools and I try to do that in all parts of the district and it's really um, a, a fantastic opportunity for me to learn about the communities and learn about the context and also for us to see how what we debate and we talk about here at, at this table and that I do with my senior team how that's actually translated uh, to the schools and one of the things that Jeff and Riley and I are doing as well as part of our executive team meetings is that periodically we hold these meetings on the road and visit the schools and have our meetings. And it's really, I think, valuable for Jeff, for Riley and myself uh, to get that school perspective. And I really encourage open feedback from the schools that we visit around what is working for them and what are some of the things that are potential uh, barriers that are, are getting in the way. So that's been one of the things that has really been one of the most enjoyable uh, parts of the role. I've also had the opportunity to learn a lot about the different departments. I've spent my career obviously pr predominantly on the academic side of the organization, but in order for any large uh, company or district to work well, there's a very important corporate side of the organization and so you need to learn a lot about the business services, facilities, directors, all these different our records management. Anyone had, that hasn't had the opportunity to take a visit to our records management, please reach out to Bonnie. It's really uh, a well-established and pretty incredible thing in terms of the amount of information that we store and process and, and keep control of. Um, and then I have regular v meetings with uh, my superintendents of education and the, the longer that we are working together, uh, we are developing what I believe to be relationships of trust and so people are starting to feedback to me about what it is that I'm doing well, what are some of the things that I could improve on and what are the th some of the things that they may need from me in terms of supporting them in their capacity and creating those conditions for them to be very successful because I truly value the role and expertise that they bring. I've also had the opportunity to learn a lot about our community, uh, different communities. I've uh, been had the good fortune of visiting our Indigenous communities and going out and visiting those communities. I've had the opportunity to visit other uh, institutions of learning, Fanshawe, Western, London Catholic District School Board, uh, our healthcare providers, just a lot of the really, just to get to know the vibrancy of the uh, community partnerships that are available in Thames Valley and just how important these relationships are. And I think we all know moving forward in education that really these kind of important uh, relationships are vital for us implementing our strategic plan. One of the things I'm committed to is being a lifelong learner. I'm fortunate to be a part of the Council of Directors of Ontario. We also have a Southwest Code direction. Uh, I'm involved with numerous mentor-mentee relationships, but we have also brought in a couple of critical friends to work with our senior team. Uh, we work regularly with Mitch LePage, and that's really around how our team functions. Uh, how do we leverage our strengths as leaders? How do we take a look at what things we're not as naturally inclined to do, do well, and how do we over, how do we compensate for that? And also as a collective, as a senior team, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what are our areas for improvement? Uh, we work with Stephen Katz primarily around how do we build our capacity to support principals. Uh, we have a very positive relationship with our provincial Ontario uh, Principals Council, which I think has been really, really important, especially in this area of very difficult labor relations. Um, had some really good learning that Arlene has organized uh, through Gillian Tuck Caterna and Michael Hines around getting to know more about the role of trustees. And uh, also was really fortunate to attend the public education symposium with a number of trustees last week. And I was really impressed with just not only the networking opportunities, but just the overall quality of presentations and speakers. So that's something that I think is really important for all of us to continue to engage in that professional learning. Recognizing that we are uh, preparing for change, right? We're using this time to analyze information, to understand context and then to really put together an operational plan that is concrete and actionable. And even though we're in a bit of a pause with some of this laser, uh, labor unrest, we still are doing the teaching and learning and we're still moving the work forward at school. So we're finding creative ways to keep that learning agenda forward and protect those relationships with staff because this will be uh, resolved at some point. And when it is, we all need to work really productively together and I also keep very close contact with a number of other directors and the Ministry of Education to try to, to work us through that and I'm really proud of the in motion annual operational plan that we have developed this year 
change management and transforming an organization is not an easy process. It requires strong relationships, relationship building. It requires self-awareness. It requires the ability, the vulnerability to accept feedback um, when some things don't land exactly how you would like them to land, but you were always ready to learn. So moving forward, I'm gonna to continue to listen, to be re receptive to feedback, to build the capacity of leadership of myself and our team, to try to clarify expectations, to try to reduce the clutter in the system and arrive at optimal solutions. I believe that we're now at almost 80,000 students and almost 10,000 staff. So we are the fourth largest school district in the province. We're in top 10 in the country. This is a big, big organization with tremendous influence and impact on the lives of students. I'm committed to working collaboratively with our trustees and our student trustees, maintaining positive relationships. Uh, being generous with my time and committing to creating environments and engagements around a clear, simple set of priorities that eventually will lead to improvement for our students. So that is my update. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Director Fisher relative to his uh, entry plan? Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that information with us and, uh, and the system. We'll move, move along in our reports from administration, 2019-2020 uh, review of potential classroom closures, elementary and secondary panels, and Associate Director Pratt will get us started. Thank you. Uh, good evening uh, through the chair. Uh, before we get started, I just want to introduce the team before you this evening. Um, certainly appreciate the expertise of, of everyone on the team uh, in uh, preparing this analysis over the last several months. So Carlos Enriquez, uh, Manager of Capital Projects. Chris Yo is our Manager of Facility Services. And Bethany Martin, Manager of Human Resources. As well as uh, both Linda and Kathy's input uh, that went into um, this report that you have before you this evening. So just uh, as an introduction, at the June 18th board meeting, um, trustees passed a motion for administration to review potential closing of classrooms in order to address empty pupil places primarily as a budget cost saving measure. So with that, we formed a multidisciplinary committee uh, to review this request. And in this review, as highlighted in the report, we had three key assumptions uh, as we went through this exercise. Programming space was not reviewed or included in this review. Uh, so when we talk about program space, that means science labs, general arts rooms, gymnasiums, tech rooms, music as we didn't want to directly impact the student experience with this proposal and eliminate course offerings that they might be taking currently. Second is we wanted to leave one uh, minimum of one learning support room in each school. And then third, allocated one empty classroom per each school just as a buffer in case of um, uh, enrollment changes for flexibility and growth. And uh, so with that, we reviewed a preliminary report of uh, surplus classrooms that could be potentially closed, and we included that as your appendix in your board package. So on the elementary panel, um, using staffing allocations and facility classroom data, we identified 119 classrooms that could be potentially closed within 40 sec 46 elementary schools. And when we look at elementary, student enrollment and grade distribution had the greatest impact on classroom utilization. So that means that elementary schools with a low utilization rate may not necessarily yield a high number of empty classrooms, as we still need to staff classrooms appropriately as grade two, three, four, um, utilizing split classes wherever we can to staff as efficiently as possible. So for example, if we take any one of those, such as Zora Public School that's on the list, it has a classroom utilization of 63%. However, due to the grade distribution and enrollment, 11 classrooms are still uh, maintained and required at that school, which only yields three potential classroom closures. And that's even with utilization being maximized with the majority of the classes in Zora being all split grades. So in many instances, underutilized schools don't require fewer classrooms, but rather they just have fewer students within each classroom. On the secondary panel, we reviewed schools with a utilization rate of lower than 65% or in essence, those schools with greater than 250 empty people places. And with that, um, 
we looked at course scheduling and facility information to identify surplus classroom space. So in the secondary, we identified 55 classrooms within 12 of our secondary schools. Um, local programming offerings have the greatest impact on classroom utilization in the secondary panel. As secondary schools may run smaller class sizes to meet the needs of students as well as our collective agreement requirements. So secondary schools with low utilization rates may not yield a high number of empty classrooms. So as an example, if you look at a tech course that's offered only once per year at a secondary school, we still would be required to maintain that square footage and that space throughout the entire year, which is common practice in some of our, especially our smaller rural secondary schools. Over the past several years, um, we've also been taking steps to proactively reduce energy consumption in our schools, which include such things as automated building automation systems, uh, which controls temperature in classrooms, different temperature settings which are employed at all hours to minimize energy consumption, as well as the installation of light sensors and lighting upgrades, LED lighting, to reduce our demand on electricity. So as a result, with all of these initiatives that we've already put in place, um, it did, the, uh, the analysis didn't yield much in the way of material savings around energy use. And as highlighted in the report, the main driver of operational savings by closing classrooms would be the reduction of custodial staff within our board. And as, as highlighted in the report, with the collective agreement language recently ratified, as well as previous collective agreement language within QP agreements, uh, we have job protection language in place, which prevents us from reducing any custodial staff. So therefore, from an operational savings perspective, um, we didn't realize any savings on the custodial. So while it was very important to go through this exercise, um, at the end of the day, it didn't realize the savings that would be potential. It's also important to highlight that uh, some other boards have realized some savings in this area. Um, and the, the caveat is that um, boards are able to reduce um, staffing uh, um, levels when you look at custodial staffing if you're in a declining enrollment board or if you're doing school closures. Because we're not a declining enrollment board, it prevented us from reducing staff. So at this point in time, um, we it didn't uh, realize any material operational savings from doing this review. Uh, so we recommend no further action at this time, uh, but my, my team would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Associate Director Pratt. I'll open the floor to questions. I will, though, uh, just be, I will, though, just with these sort of uh, parameters. We have Trustee Pizzolatto who's on the phone, and so I will begin with the speakers list and have everyone ask two questions. Once everyone has asked two questions the first time, I'll then ask Trustee Pizzolatto to ask her questions, and then we'll work through the speakers list in a similar fashion. So are there any questions? Uh, the first round of que two questions, uh, Trustee Rahman will begin with you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the report. Um, so just so that I'm clear on the understanding, the $18,000 worth of savings is all energy related savings. That is correct. Thank you. So uh, when I was looking at this and the energy savings, and I, even though I was reading that it was negligible in, the, in terms of the 18,000 as it was referred, um, I was thinking about it from the context of what my kids are learning right now in curriculum around energy savings and conservation. And so when my kids are telling me to turn off the lights, mom, because you're not in a room, and uh, they're telling me to turn down the heat uh, when they come home, I'm, I was thinking about the parallels in the messaging. And so for me, this changed from the perspective of which we looked at this conversation initially. And I was thinking of it from the environmental and the uh, conservation perspective. So I just wanted to ask about uh, from the perspective of environmental impact, you did mention that we have looked at other adjustments within our system in order to find and realize savings on the energy side. But do we have any, um, other than the $18,000, do we have any energy, ideas of energy savings in terms of a quantifiable amount with relationship to this conversation? 
I can certainly start off, but I'll turn it over to uh, Manager Henrique, who is responsible for energy um, within our board. Um, so we have done, um, as I mentioned in my report, significant um, initiatives to reduce our carbon footprint as a school board, um, including um, the way we both procure energy and the way that we consume energy. Um, but uh, I'll turn it over to Carlos to provide some more highlights in terms of some of the initiatives that we're currently working on. Um, and sorry, uh, just to add to that as well, um, we have developed or are in the midst of finalizing a presentation that we are planning on bringing to the Planning and Priorities um, Committee over the next uh, couple of months to slot it in where the agenda will uh, um, be flexible to include that so that we can have a more detailed, fulsome discussion with the Board of Trustees on energy. Perfect, thank you th through the Chair. So um, as Associate uh, Director Pratt was mentioning, um, we are going to be embarking on uh, our five-year energy management plan, which we'll be presenting at a future uh, Planning and Priorities uh, Committee meeting. Um, and through that uh, presentation, uh, we would endeavor to uh, show the trustees basically what uh, the Board is doing with respect to uh, energy conservationism, um, particularly with um, our uh, partnership with um, Learning Support Services um, and through curriculum. Um, through. So a big piece of that plan is with respect to behavioral changes. Um, and, uh, and, and we'd sort of go through that with respect to this report as well. Um, a lot of the things that, uh, why we haven't realized as much savings as we might think is we already uh, program our classroom spaces to reduce temperatures at certain times uh, of the year, of the day. Uh, so within, um, before uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and after 4 o'clock, our temperatures go down automatically. And similarly, um, we have light sensor, a lot of light sensors in our schools, and we continue to upgrade to LED and, and, uh, and, and those types of technologies. Trustee Hunt. Thank you very much for this report, and I, I'm... I'm glad to see it before us, and I'm interested to know a bit about some of the, the um, you know, for someone looking at home at what our co or our, our neighboring boards have been able to achieve in terms of like $3,000 a year demonstrated costs um, per shuttered classroom, and we're looking at $100 or $110 a classroom in energy costs. Are we substantially more energy efficient than the boards next? To us, or do you have an understanding of how their that three thousand dollars broke down in in the other boards? Can you compare our costs and our breakdown versus theirs? That was the example. Sure, through the chair, um, the team uh, specifically reached out to Lamp and Kent and spoke to uh, their energy and facility staff um, to help understand how they built their model. And uh, in the case of Lamp and Kent, the three thousand um, dollars. That they uh, that they targeted for that um, savings uh, actually is 100% related to staff savings. They didn't even include the energy piece. Um, they just they um, determined that it's a bit arduous uh, in order to calculate on a classroom at classroom basis. So they just had the assumption that any energy savings would just be more icing on the cake or further further savings. So. Um, so when you're comparing apples to apples, um, it's not it's probably apples to oranges right now because we highlighted just this small sliver of energy savings where they were looking more at the, the staff and the custodial staff savings in their model. Thank you for sharing that breakdown. Um, I would assume because of the varying condition of renew or state of renewal of the schools across our board, that different schools have different levels of energy efficiency, different levels of automation. Um, is there any correlation between the, the schools that we've identified and the spaces that we've identified and the level of energy efficiency in that school? Because what I'm saying is like an average of $100 probably varies quite widely across where we've got schools on propane and things like that. Um, I, I was hoping to see and like have an understanding of specifically the schools that where we could maximize our energy savings and 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 whatnot. Um, I'm having trouble understanding why some schools don't even appear on the list. If they're not on the list in elementary, does that mean they didn't have a surplus classroom? 
uh, through the chair. So yes, yeah, so the, the list that's before you is the list of the potential classrooms from our preliminary analysis. So if uh, school is not there, then based off of the assumptions that are in the report uh, and based off of our analysis between staffing and facilities, then there was no surplus uh, classroom to be, uh, there was no surplus classroom. Any other uh, questions before I ask Trustee uh, Pizzolatto? Trustee Smith? Thank you. Thank you for the report, too. I was wondering a, a comment. You kept one room in every school available for growth. Maybe I'm not understanding diff the difference between closed and mothballed. Uh, I was on a tour of Arthur Golden, and there are a lot of classrooms in that school that are. I would say mothballed, they're not using them at all. Um, are those closed or is that, what do you, what do you call that? Uh, so in this report, when we meant, when we mean closed, it would be the operational uh, procedure that we'd move forward with physically locking that classroom so that uh, the staff and the students in the school would not be able to access but other than our own custodial staff for obviously health and safety purposes. Okay. May I follow up? Then, um, then I'm not too sure why you wouldn't be saying that there are 335 classes because if you're keeping a spare classroom in every school, I mean, it could be open just by opening a door. Do you see what I mean? So why, why wouldn't that be, why wouldn't they be included so you, you've got like 174 classrooms that you feel are available, but then you said you saved one in every school, so that's another 161 classes. There could be over 300, well, it'd be 335 classrooms that might be available to close. And well, I don't know if that would increase the savings or not. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, through the chair, um, in the preliminary analysis, this was our, our, our first blush at looking at um, the review school by school. Um, so at this point in the analysis, um, the, uh, we wanted to present to the trustees before we moved forward to any phase B if there was going to be a phase B. So the next step in the process is we would have to actually engage in conversations with all you know, 160 or, uh, of our school principals to understand um, uh, on the ground every single classroom and what they may or may not be using it for. So we could identify based on the class configurations and based on HR staffing, how many teachers, how many classrooms are being used at each and every school. And we compare that with actual enrollment and we compare that to the actual floor plans and blueprints of each school which identify the number of classrooms. We took a little bit of a conservative approach by saying, let's keep from our analysis one classroom at each school as just a buffer in case Perhaps they're using it for additional special need, special education supports for uh, having a lear learning support teacher or uh, perhaps there's other rooms such as using for sensory rooms. So we wanted to just, in a, and from our perspective, it wasn't even uber con conservative. Just we said, let's just keep one at each school identified for special requirements at each and every school. Is there a trustee who has not yet asked a question who would like before I ask Trustee Pizzolatto? Seeing none. Trustee Pizzolatto, do you have any questions? Yeah, I do. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead. Um, so on my list, I don't see Westminster Public School or Springfield. So I don't know if that was done, um, if this list was done earlier. As well, if we did close classrooms, Will it cost the board any money to um, close classrooms for a year to see how this actually goes? We'll start and I'll look for uh, anyone else that wants to add any comments. Um, it would, there, would, there would be certainly a cost, um, I guess, twofold to closing a classroom um, to Trustee Smith's question because we would have to change the physical locks of that classroom door. Uh, so we would need to replace it with hardware, uh, new locking mechanisms so that nobody has access to uh, gain access to the room. The second cost would be 
um, either internally or through an external third party hiring a company to actually do the reprogramming um, to set temperature set points a little bit differently. So there's two variables to the cost if we would actually physically close the classroom. Um, I'll, um, if there's any other thoughts, okay. Thank you. Do you have a second question, Trustee Pizzolatto? Sorry, seeing none, we'll move to the second round of questions. Uh, Trustee Hunt. Um, it, assuming the criteria could be a little less conservative and we could figure out a way to quickly open and close classrooms as needed, or we look at schools where... Marianne Piccolato oh. has joined the conference. Oh, sorry, she's back. <laughs> How much energy savings would we need to realize to overcome the costs of programming? I mean, building automation is supposed to provide us with flexibility and, and insight. How much energy savings would, would it take for this to be worthwhile doing? Um, it, the, the programming is on an hourly basis, basically. We don't have uh, in-house staff that would be able to handle uh, sort of that workload in terms of reprogram every school. Um, so at this point, I don't have exact numbers because we would have to, uh, because every school is different. Um, we are right now going through a building automation system upgrade where we're trying to um, go uh, to one more generic system. And so right now, currently in all of our schools, we have different uh, building automation uh, system vendors. And so it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. So the, I would say that the cost to reprogram um, is not significant. Um, it's just, it would be probably a couple hours of a technician's time uh, to do so. Follow up? Uh, my thinking is that we have an opportunity to save energy and a, and a certain amount of money, which is perhaps conservative. Um, and at the same time, while we can't reduce um, staffing and, and the staffing complement, we could direct that, that staff time to um, other areas of the school um, which would have a positive benefit within, more so than cleaning empty classrooms. We have a pilot where we've modeled the energy and demonstrated the ability to reduce energy usage. Um, if the costs to, to do that programming don't exceed um, the, the energy saved, I don't see how that isn't to win and, and working towards um, a future model and a protocol. Um, unless I'm, I'm missing other, other things. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Trustee Hunt. I mean, that, that is an option on the table and yours to consider as trustees if you wanted to go down um, that path in terms of uh, locking these uh, rooms and closing them. Um, we, we had those considerations as we talked through as a group um, and recognizing that, yes, we would perhaps save approximately 18,000 energy savings by closing these classrooms. It's not to say, um, as uh, Trustee Smith highlighted, that many classrooms in summer of schools like Golden are already closed and not being used or cleaned. Um, so, so we are having some internal savings without even f formalizing it. Um, but I think we just have to offer, we have to balance that out with operationalizing that and what that means and what the impacts are to the individual schools on the ground. Um, because although we identify that a school may have three or four classes available uh, that may yield um, a small utility savings, um, what are the impacts of, of going in and having those conversations with principals and teachers saying, okay, now you can't use these rooms, um, even though you know they may have some valid reasons. So. Um, not to say we wouldn't achieve energy savings, we were just trying to balance it off what's best for kids, what's best for the school environments, uh, and is, is closing one or two um, classrooms in, in the identified school worth it um, in terms of um, trying to impl implement, type, implement that um, against the savings that we might achieve. So we, we struggled with that same question that you, you're asking us. Um, but we just 
we felt that um, eighteen thousand dollars at this point um, wasn't significant enough to uh, to proceed with it. Trustee Skinner. Thank you, and, and through you, Chair, and um, just sort of building off of what you just said there, uh, Jeff, is it you know looking at this report, it appears as though like this is basically a non-starter. I I because there's other things to consider in terms of uh, you know the savings it's the implementation costs so if we think about we have to change the locks that's for that's probably four hundred dollars per lock and if we're saving on average a hundred dollars per classroom that's gonna take us four years to get back that cost and by that time you know things may have changed right so I, th I don't I from what I'm seeing here and I think the reports good and I appreciate the work that you guys did to bring this forward I just um, I don't see um, that as being a, solu a solution or a cost savings. It's probably going to be cost costly to us. It'll cost. We'll have to come up with extra money. Uh, uh, thanks, Trustee Skinner, and uh, and I perhaps should have mentioned, but um, one of the conversation pieces that uh, that the staff had with um, with other boards that have gone through this, such as Lampton, is. Um, the one thing they express is that operational piece, the implementation piece, um, locking principals, locking teachers out of rooms was the most difficult part of the process. And so that's why at this point we, we hadn't even engaged principals because we wanted to do the, a thorough analysis first, look at the numbers and look to see if it, if it made sense to move forward. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Thanks. Uh, Trustee Ruddock and then Trustee Smith. Thank you. Um, so I was just doing some quick math here. So 119 classes, um, 25 children average-ish per class is about 3,000 kids for $18,000 in savings, which, I mean, I think is not um, horrible. I mean, 18,000 is 18,000 if we can save it, great. Um, but what I'm struggling with is that we've heard continually that there's a significant cost to empty pupil places. And yet we have the ability to you know, kind of save or shutter off 3,000 empty pupil places and our savings is only $18,000. So what is it that, um, can you help me understand, like, I guess, where the significant cost is then in empty pupil places? Sure, thanks, uh, through the chair. Um, when you look at school consolidations and school closures and we reduce square footage of buildings, one of the big savings that school boards realize, including our board by closing over 40 schools, is the efficiencies in staffing. So right now when you look at the appendix and you look at, um, you notice that there's a lot of schools with significant um, underutilization, but we don't identify many classrooms that we can close. And that's because at this point we have never triple stacked or triple graded, so we can't we're not saying let's put a two, three, four together and a four, five, six. Split classes are the only um, option that we've entertained. So when you look at these these class configurations, they're as efficient as possible. But when you look at the actual numbers of bums and seats, they're relatively low. So instead of having um, you know 25 in a class, you're having 12 or 14 perhaps in a class. It's so, so the savings come from efficiencies and staffing and getting um, maximizing the amount of students um, based on collective agreement language uh, and uh, ministry parameters, um, getting the maximum of students in front of one single teacher. Um, and when you look at other components of um, uh, savings, it's not just the heating and the cooling of that um, one particular room, but there's the building envelope, roofing, um, exterior, um, there's a whole bunch of factors that are included in the renewal that, for example, we're maintaining 100% um, of a 1,200 square, or sorry, 1,200 um, capacity school, but there's only 300 or 200 kids in the school, but we still have to do the same amount of roofing and lawn maintenance and snow plowing. So those are a lot of those other auxiliary costs that, uh, as boards, we struggle with um, when we have empty pupil places. Trustee Smith. Thank you. Um, as, as those of us who have worked in the schools know that in the summers, 
uh, the desks and everything that's in the classroom gets taken out, put in the halls, the floors are stripped and redone. And uh, there's a, I don't know how long that takes, but it's quite a bit of work. And uh, those classrooms at Bowdoin, they, the floors in those rooms uh, look the same on the last day of June that they did on the 1st of September. So really nothing has to be done there. I'm wondering if there would be a positive um, effect by closing some classrooms like they've done there in that the staff in the summer would have 174 fewer classrooms to take everything out of, put in the hall, strip the floors, redo the floors, everything, and, and the people could do because we also know that in the summer in the class in the schools it's quite a rush to get everything done and sometimes we can't get everything done during the summer so I'm wondering whether that would uh, make a difference in that way I don't know what you think uh, I'll, I'll uh, look to manager Yo to provide a little comments on um, on I guess the the cleaning practices over the summer and whether or not, if a classroom has not been used in a year, whether or not there's the need to actually pull everything out and redo it. I, um, perhaps Chris can speak to that. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, through the chair, the uh, classrooms as they be closed, what uh, that process would look like is, is basically setting it up, so doing uh, more or less a spring cleaning to it, so it would be set in a, in a setting that uh, if it was required for service again, it's ready to go. Um, so similar to Vodin, uh, those classrooms have been, we'll say, spring cleaned and prepped, and then they are, uh, they're not in use. So any classroom closures, that would be the process to follow, is, is really a final prep that it's sitting uh, as a spare classroom set and ready. Um, really to change gears if we needed to and, and needed to use that class, it's, it's set and ready. So. Follow up, Trustee Smith. Thank you. So then uh, are you saying that there would be more time available to do other work in the school because you don't have to deal with those classrooms in the summer then? Is that what you're saying? Uh, through the chair, uh, potentially yes. Uh, yeah. We would um, try and maximize the staff at the site and, and repurpose for, uh, for other areas. We are restricted in uh, relocating staff to other schools. Uh, we have restrictions in, in that sense where, you know, they have an assigned uh, school that they report to. So at the school level, yes, we would maximize, you know, they're maybe not cleaning those classrooms that have been closed. Uh, so they would be uh, tasked with other duties within the school. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I will then ask Trustee Pizzolatto, do you have any questions? No, I'm good, thanks. Any other questions related to the report, Trustee Rahman? Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, at some point, uh, Associate Director Pratt, you mentioned that you had considered uh, the different options, and one almost sounded like a pilot option. Am I, maybe I just heard that somehow. Um, but I, my question is, um, would you see an opportunity in a pilot in maybe one of our one of the schools that's on the list that maybe has a number of surplus classrooms to um, to see if there's if there's something more we learn from a pilot. Uh, through the uh, the chair, um, the the school that we've had some conversations on that sort of jumped off the page is Arthur Bowden, and the one that's been highlighted, it has the most uh, uh, surplus space. And 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 where you look at the Lambton report. Um, where they get the, the largest bang for the buck is when you're actually closing wings or floors. And, um, and, and Bowdoin is one uh, that um, we as a committee agreed that we want to look at uh, further. So uh, be pleased to provide an update to the board or at a planning meeting at some point and just in terms of um, some, some of the quick operational things that we can do to uh, um, more formalize some of these uh, classroom closures. Follow up. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate that that kind of an update. Um, similarly, when I looked at Sir Johnny McDonald, I was thinking about um, the space template at that school as well, and just wondering um, because you mentioned closing wings or closing whatnot. I'm just thinking of that the fact that the number eight jumped out. If you could speak to that school as well. Thank you.
Thank you, and through the chair, I can speak to Sir John A. McDonald um, a bit. Um, that, those numbers, as uh, Associate Director Pratt indicated, were based on staffing allocation that was done at the school. So it wasn't actually physically going to the school in doing a room by room inspection to see how those spaces are being used. And so um, staffing would not have an awareness of whether or not there is a learn classroom in schools. And so those rooms would be needed to use for a half day. Staffing may not uh, be aware that one of the rooms is used for a sensory room for the students in the developmental education classroom. So that's just a preliminary number, that number of eight classrooms. And we'd have to go to the school, uh, as Associate Director Pratt indicated, and do a room by room review or analysis of all the schools to look at uh, potential savings and weighing those savings of closing classrooms with ensuring that we have optimized program opportunities for our students. Trustee Hunt. Would um, schools without a dedicated music room have been identified as well? Like the fact that you have got an empty classroom that's not OTG listed as with risers and whatnot. I, I, I think we know what we're talking about, schools where, where they're using a room for music room, but it's otherwise listed as empty people place. Yeah, through the chair. So um, through facilities, we understand the schools that don't have a dedicated general arts room. And so through this analysis, we would purpose a classroom as a general arts room. And so we wouldn't use that as part of the calculation. Might that explain why some of the schools we might expect to see on here aren't listed as having any space? That's correct. So similarly with an LST room, if there's not a dedicated LST room, we would assume that there would need to be a space in the school that would have to uh, house the LST room. Thank you for recognizing the value of those spaces in those schools. Any other questions? Follow-up questions, thoughts that have come to mind in response to listening to the answers provided this evening? Seeing none, Trustee Pizzolatto, one more opportunity if you have any questions. No, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Well, then, thank you so much for bringing this information forward to us this evening. We certainly look forward to any subsequent reports or information that you can share with us relative to, uh, relative to this information. We'll move along in our agenda to our next agenda item, uh, procurement of portables. Thank you. Through the chair, I'll start the report this evening, and then I'll turn it over to Manager Henrique. So, um, uh, as the report indicates before you, uh, we are looking for a board motion and approval uh, for $3.1 million uh, from funded from our accumulated surplus to fund the cost of portables. Um, as we talked about in our last um, board report, this clearly identifies uh, a growth board uh, and an increase in enrollment that we're currently experiencing. This report is, tip, um, is um, uh, before you this evening, probably two or three months before we'll actually have the school by school enrollment. Um, that we usually always do in the springtime. But based on the demand of the, the portable manufacturer um, and, and based on the increased enrollment um, across the province of boards, um, we really wanted to get a head start on getting an order in with the uh, portable manufacturer so that we can um, make the best decision for our students um, so they're, they're, they're not um, in a temporary uh, gymnasium or temporary stage for three, four months until uh, we were, were in receipt of a portable in November, December. So I'll turn it over to Carlos to provide some more information and background on our on our re request this evening. Perfect, thanks. So a report uh, outlining the current portable needs is presented uh, for your approval tonight. Uh, TVDSP continues to experience sustained enrollment growth, resulting from factors such as immigration and migration. So based on the enrollment projections, localized enrollment pressures will result in a continued need for portables next year. We currently do not have sufficient portables to meet the demand for the next school year. 
With the increased enrollment over the past three years, we have also had not the adequate opportunity to decommission an aging portable inventory. Given an estimated service life of 20 years, we currently have 153 portables that are beyond this recommended service life. The health and safety of our facilities is paramount. Operation staff through daily cleaning identify any issues and our maintenance staff address them immediately. Maintenance staff also complete annual reviews to address repairs to extend our portable uh, existing service life. Typically, as uh, Associate Director Pratt mentioned, during the spring, concurrently with staffing allocations is where we would identify our portable needs. In discussions with our pre-qualified portable vendor, NRB, an order is required in late January to provide for a timely delivery in the summer. Ordering delays may result in classrooms being accommodated in alternative locations such as libraries or gyms for the start of next school year if we do not place our order now. An accommodation plan uh, will be delivered later this year which will provide recommendations to better balance our enrollment pressures. However, this would not alter our immediate accommodation pressures for next year. Any surplus portables that we order over the summer may be used to replace our aging inventory or maintain to address future portable needs. As the temporary accommodation grant that we receive is insufficient to cover our portable needs with respect to moves and purchases, and in addition, the Ministry of Removing the Ability of School Boards to Utilize School Renewal Funds, Administration is recommending the following, that the Thames Valley District School Board procure 25 portables from NRB Inc. at an estimated cost of $3,137,975, appropriated from accumulated surplus to fund the cost of the portables. Please take any questions. So again, a similar process relative to questions. I will open the floor to two questions by trustees. And once you've asked your two questions, I'll ask Trustee Pizzolatto for her questions and move on through the list that way. Trustee Skinner, did I see your hand up? You can lead off the questions. Thank you, and, and through you, Chair. Um, just to begin with, I think this is obviously a very important purchase and something we must do um, with, with the number that we have that are beyond um, the years that they should be. So, um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're bringing this forward to us. And I'm also very happy to hear um, that we would, we're gonna be creating an asset management plan um, because it'll be, I think it's important for us to be um, as on top of this as we possibly can and to understand um, where our assets are in terms of their age and condition so that um, we can make sure that these uh, funding decisions are part of our budget process every year because it's, it's important. Um, but the one question I just wanted to start off with and then hopefully I can go to the bottom of the list is uh, in terms of portables. Portables are unfunded? They are funded through a temporary uh, uh, accommodation grant, um, but they are certainly underfunded. Um, and uh, across the province, this is now becoming a pervasive issue with growth boards that there is not enough funding for portables at boards. And uh, so I do sit on the COSBO, the Council of Senior Business Officials, uh, and have regular meetings on a monthly basis with the ministry. And we have identified a temporary accommodation working group to be able to provide the ministry with recommendations on how to improve this funding gap. And um, I've nominated Superintendent Lynn to uh, chair that committee. So uh, she thanks me, I know she does. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent Lynn, for taking on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Trustee Skinner, did you have a second question? No, I was at the bottom. I have you at the bottom. Any other questions? Trustee Pull Hill. Um, so the first question is: is we don't we don't have any um, awareness of how these 25 portables are going to be used. They could all be required, and none of them be utilized to replace the aging ones. Is that the case? Thank you, through the chair. So what we've done in this analysis is uh, try to use our projections for next year to inform our decision. But uh, the difficulty in that is that um, we don't know great distribution um, when it comes to projections. Um, so uh, we've taken uh, an informed decision of where we think the portables might be just based off historical information, and that's how we've come up to the 25. So to answer your question, Yes, we may use all 25, and none of them would go towards replacing our aging inventory. Um, but the, the hope is that um, once we uh, move forward with our accommodation plan, 
we'll have a better idea of where our five-year projections will be and that we can inform our asset management plan uh, to provide that to the board um, with our best thinking of um, when and where we're going to be replacing our aging in, uh, inventory. Second question or follow-up, Trustee Paul Hill. Um, so that, that leads into my second question, um, which I, I think I provided, so hopefully um, you have the answer. It just how, how many of these portables and the schools that seem to have high numbers of portables located on them, um, how many of them do we see, say, in the next five years being resolved by boundary reviews, um, new school builds, and all, all of those capital project plans? How many, like, what do you see? Or are we waiting on some kind of bigger report to come? I can start. Um, through the chair, um, through our accommodation plan that we'll be engaging with the board on uh, in the month of March, uh, we'll have some further dialogue on, on our planning and the priority areas um, that we are recommending that we need to look at. Um, so that's one variable. Um, but with the limitation of no uh, ability to uh, look at school consolidations or closures and really uh, create efficiencies, um, where the other area that we're looking at is um, the capital priority submissions that we've already submitted to the ministry. So for, for instance, we have Masonville renovation underway and there's how many portables on site there? 14. 14. So in another um, less than 12 months, we'll have 14 portables come available at Masonville that we can redeploy. Um, and then when we look at uh, some of our other capital priorities or urgent needs, such as um, Eagle Heights uh, Public School, where we have 17, 17, um, 17 portables on site, if we are able to uh, get the grants approval on that and do the addition. So we will be able to have some flexibility, but in the last two years with limited school closures and limited uh, availability to do anything very um, substantial on the planning front um, and uh, coupled that with uh, three years of uh, uh, I'd say substantial enrollment growth it's really put a pressure on uh, temporary accommodation in the short term. In the long term uh, through our asset managing and our accommodation plan which we'll talk about in March um, we're hopeful that um, we'll be able to minimize needs. I have Trustee Reddick on the list and then Trustee Hunt. Trustee Reddick? Thank you. Um, and then I'll go to the bottom because I just came up with more questions. Um, so how many of these overcapacity schools that are needing portables are surrounded by or, na or have neighboring low enrollment schools that an attendance area review uh, would reconcile the over under issue. Uh, we don't have that information with this evening. That's that's what we'll be discussing um, next month with the actual accommodation planning. Um, but I guess to further answer your question, um, Trustee Ruddick, um, even if um, we'd engage in attendance area reviews on some of these areas where we require portables now. That's a, a, a 12 month port, uh, sorry, a 12 month process. Um, so in order to rectify some of these areas, such as Eagle Heights and other pressure points within our system, the intense area review process takes a year to go through that cycle. So this is an immediate need um, that we need um, for September of 2020. And, and then in March, when we talk about accommodation planning, we'll have the ability and opportunity to explore some of these high and urgent needs across our system where we'll be able to do some um, um, much better efficiencies at um, uh, right sizing some school areas with attendance area reviews. A second question, Trustee Reddick? Okay. Trustee Hunt and then Trustee Wellman. I'm, uh, I'm looking at the projection of net portable needs, which is Appendix A. The planning areas we seem to be referring to don't seem to align with any of the past um, draft accommodation plans, so I'm having a hard time understanding where these areas are south of Highway 401. Um, some of the high school ones seem to make sense. Is there a, a map we can put up that can tell us about where these portables are projected to be needed? Um, 
So with hiring a professional planner, uh, when we hired Christy Kent this year, um, she's really looking at things with new eyes and being critical of, of, uh, of um, not where we've come from as a planning department, but how we can move forward. And so she has um, taken the liberty of um, developing or refining or tweaking our board planning areas that makes a lot more sense from a, a planning perspective. And so these are the planning areas that we'll be getting into a lot further depth in uh, in March when we go through the plan. Uh, but at this point in time, um, I don't have, um, yeah, um, sorry. yeah, so at this point in time, we just have the maps that we've included in the presentation this evening. Okay, then if you'd allow me a qu two questions, specific questions without having that understanding. We talked about, um, you know, capital projects that will free up certain portables at Masonville, possibly some solution within, I won't put a number of years on it, but at, at Eagle Heights that will see the need for less portables there. Where do they fit in here? Where do we see the 14 portables coming back from Masonville? Or how many of the portables that are gonna be freed up are useful? I, we're try, I, you're saying these are all net new needed there's no projected replacement of any portables in this? So through the chair, so this is for September to be operational in September. So in September, Masonville will not be giving up uh, 14 portables because we're not ready yet. So that's, it's not included. Are there any portables that need to be replaced because they are unsafe or, un, or beyond their useful life? Are any of these, those? So as I said it in uh, the report, um, maintenance and operations uh, deal with any health and safety issues. So as of right now, all of our portables are safe to be in. If there's any issues, then we'll address them immediately because we don't have any surplus portables and we'll do whatever necessary repairs are required to maintain the health and safety of the portables. Trustee Rahman. Thank you and through you, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. I'm, I am still struggling to understand this concept of, in my own mind, uh, of net new. So, um, you know, if come September, uh, how many would be considered net new and how many would be replacing stock that we think needs to be replaced is something that for me was, was challenging to get through and understand. So is there any clarity of that piece? Um. Yeah, I, I recognize this, the, the struggle in, in the, the details of this uh, appendix. Um, as we indicated, the school by school projections, uh, when we work with um, planning, work with the principals, um, happens in the springtime. And, and at that point in time, um, the principals um, edit the projections. It goes back to planning. Planning then does a final assessment and agrees to what the enrollment is, not even school by school, but grade by grade. Then we feed that information to HR and Bethany and Linda and her team uh, develop the actual staffing allocations on the school by school. So then they figure out, okay, we need how many FDK classes, how many grade ones, twos, and, and so forth up into grade eight. And then they identify the exact amount of classrooms that each school needs. So that, that process doesn't happen until the April, May timeframe. And in a typical year, that's enough lead time to work with our portable manufacturer to uh, order the necessary portables if we need to order, uh, to have them installed and delivered, delivered and installed for the school year in September, or maybe within a few weeks of school opening. But because there's such a huge demand provincially on this one manufacturer that makes them, um, we just thought it was imperative that we came before you now versus April or May when we have the information. Um, you as the board could certainly wait, defer your decision. Um, but what that would mean is that we would have children in cl that aren't in classrooms, you know, probably until the November, December uh, time frame. So that was the balance that we were, we were struggling with. Um, not struggling with, but that we were assessing um, when we decided that now is the right time to come to the board. We're confident in the numbers. We're confident in the projections. And, and even if, if it's 20 that we need and not 25, we have portables that are almost 40 years old in the system and we would be grateful to start replenishing them and, 
and, and uh, replacing them out. So, Associate Director Colhane. Further to Associate Director Pratt's uh, comments, I did want to make the trustees aware that we are in a position right now in some of our schools where we are still waiting for portables. It's very challenging for our school communities to be without classrooms uh, coming on to February of the school year. And so we do want to be as proactive um, as possible in establishing a plan for our schools. It also should be noted that we are up 884 additional students this year beyond what was projected and we anticipate uh, an increase in our enrollment next year and our enrollment is increasing in areas that are already at or over capacity so those students are not moving to areas that are under capacity they are moving to areas that are already at or over capacity and that's where uh, we are seeing those challenges so from a school perspective it's very important that we are ready and that our principals and our staff are ready with classrooms set up for the first day of school. It's very challenging for our staff and for our families when they are accommodated in temporary locations and then having to move uh, mid-year. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, my, something I was trying to figure out was um, if we allocate this amount, how much will we have left in accumulated surplus following? At your end, we had 22 million in accumulated surplus. Sorry, in the unappropriated accumulated. Any other, um, before I move to the second round of questions, are there a trust, is there a trustee who has not yet asked a question in this first round? Then I'll ask Trustee Pizzolatto. Trustee Pizzolatto, do you have any questions related to the procurement of portables report? I do, thanks. I'm a little perplexed um, to see that um, West Oak, uh, Lord Robert, they have portables that we desperately need, but yet we're putting JKSK um, English classes in those Cool. There's also other ones that have them, and which have portables. And we were supposed to put JKSK classes only in schools where there was groups. So if we're in desperate need of portables, why are we putting JKSK classes in schools with portables that we need? Through, uh, through the chair, uh, um, Trustee Pizzolato, if I understand your question correctly, um, when we presented that report uh, to the board um, just prior to the, the holiday break, um, the assumptions uh, going into that report is that we would not add any additional expense or add any additional uh, portables to any one of those FI schools um, because um, we heard um, from you as trustees that you, you had a, a need or desire to, to try to accommodate some of those children. So, um, so the assumption was we didn't add any expense or add, but we didn't, we didn't um, take away any of those portables from the FI sites. A second question, Trustee Pizzolatto? Uh, just following on the same line. We said we wouldn't add any more expense, but we are adding expenses because we have almost 10 portables at those French immersion schools that we can utilize in other schools. But now we have to pay uh, close to three million dollars for 25 portables. I don't. I just. It doesn't make sense to me. Thank you, Trustee Pizzolatto. Any other? Uh, so we now move to the second round of questions. I have uh, Trustee Skinner, Trustee Roddick, and Trustee Hunt who've asked to be put on the bottom of the list. So we'll begin with Trustee Skinner. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, so just to the staff, I want to thank you very much for the, for the report. And, and a lot of the things that you're saying are addressing a, lot of the, a number of concerns that have been in the back of my mind. Um, for instance, um, with the area review, 
And one thing that I've noticed in in London is that we have a lot of we have a lot of overutilization, and we have a lot of underutilization. And so distribution of the students is a big issue. And so I'm looking forward to March. Um, but in terms of the tools that are at our disposal, I think that you know watching it's probably what has it been two or three years since the moratorium. You know, I I, I think it's going it's time for action. On our, on our area reviews in London. And because I know just looking at Eagle Heights, that school is a school that desperately needs action. Um, I could name, I could probably name five or six others that are approaching the same situation. So it's, it's critical. So thank you for this report. I'm really looking forward to March. And, and um, I just think that there's not, there, some tools are not gonna be at our disposal. And, but we still, the, the time has come to act. So that's my question. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be pleased to engage in that dialogue in March. Uh, and, and I agree. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of schools. Uh, balancing utilization is always a challenge in every school board. And without some of the tools, uh, such as consolidation and closure, um, we're going to have to rely on tenancy area reviews to try to fix some of that. Um, we des desperately wishing we could wave our magic wand and enter into some consolidation and closure discussions because some of our students desperately need um, facilities with better program space uh, to be able to uh, thrive. Do you have a second question, Trustee Skinner? Okay, uh, Trustee Reddick. Thank you, and through you. I just want to follow up a little bit on Trustee Rahman's uh, question. Um, so we have 22 million. So what other capital projects um, or projects have been, has funding been earmarked for? Sorry, through the chair. That 22 million is the unappropriated. That has nothing allocated to it. Okay, so we have lots then. If Eagle Heights does not come through with government funding that we would be able to do something with that situation? Um, so um, I guess in terms of your question around the finances, just to add to uh, Superintendent Lynn's comments, um, we are um, at the next planning priorities meeting, we'll be providing an interim financial update uh, which will also include our um, revised estimates. And in that, you'll be able to see a more robust picture of our accumulated surplus. We have approximately 95 million in our board, of which 22 million is unappropriated. Um, in terms of funding um, Eagle Heights um, with our own funds versus ministry funds, um, I, I would suggest that the minister would not allow us to do that. Trustee Hunt, I have you next on the on the list. Can I? Um, I'm going to ask a question. This is just to recap the previous spending on portables, because there was um, it came out of audit committee in November, and I think we removed um, a commit. You know, and I'm also interested in the previous um, board's approval of of funds for. Um, purchase of portables. I'd like to know like how many portables we committed to purchasing and how much money over the last three years and how many we fulfilled and how much we used renewal money, which didn't end up requiring. Can you just kind of recap, re replay the, <laughs> the purchases and the acquisitions? I'm going to start in Alaska, Manager Enriquez, to help me out when I get stuck. I can tell you for last year, Last year's when we had board approval to buy up to 30 portables out of accumulated surplus. That was 3.6 million that we actually spent. We did not use accumulated surplus. That's where in audit committee we talked about we had the ability to use renewal funds and the temporary accommodation funds at that time. Um, and given our financial position, that was the more prudent approach. We don't have that availability for this year. And then last year, I believe there was 31 portables purchased during the year. Um, just to, you asked for three years, so 17, 18, we purchased four portables in total. 
that's when we started seeing the big increase in our enrollment growth, and that's where we're trying to catch up. 18, 19 is, was 31, and then so far this year, we're at 17. So I'm trying to understand, are we restricted? When we say we, say we need 25, that's our best estimate, but that doesn't accomplish any renewal, and we heard over 50% of the portables we have are beyond their useful life. Why are we only purchasing 25? Is that all we can purchase through this vendor? And can we not source from another vendor if we wanted to? Because we could be having the discussion about using this to, to improve the state of our assets and doing actual renewal. Um, so through the chair, so this report is kind of like a phase one, phase two, where we're trying to identify what our needs are for immediately for next year. And through the accommodation plan, then is where we want to put together an asset management plan for portables where we could then identify more of a five-year time frame in terms of what our projections would be and how we can start decommissioning some of these aging portables. Uh, so hopefully that answers your first question. Your second question with respect to NRB, um, this is a very niche market. Um, uh, it's similar to uh, Associate Director Pratt uh, in terms of Cosgo. I sit on OMC, which is the level down, which is uh, facility managers. And uh, we've, we've also discussed this last week in our meeting uh, with trying to get at other vendors, but um, there's no other vendors right now that um, are in this market really in Southern Ontario that can provide us with the portable needs, uh, that with the portables that we need. Um, just because, um, and it's particularly because of um, the new building code um, with respect to energy efficiency, SB10, uh, it requires um, specific prescriptive methods to construct them, so it's difficult to hire a builder um, or an erector uh, to come in and do it on site. They just don't specialize in this and uh, will not be able to give us the volume that we need. Absolutely. Uh, Trustee McKinnon. Thank you. Through you, Chair. You actually just answered the question. My question, Carlos, as you expanded on it. Uh, so I will just make sure that the, the, I will put the, on the floor that the recommendation, the recommendation that Thames Valley District School Board procure 25 portables from NRB Incorporated at an estimated cost of 3.1 million, appropriated from the accumulated surplus fund for the cost of the portables. Thank you, Trustee McKinnon. I still have several uh, speakers on the question list, and once we work through our speakers on the questioning list, then I'll look for a mover, mover of the of the motion. Uh, I have Trustee Paul Hill actually next uh, next on the on the list. Um, I'm just wondering: is there limitations to the portables in regards to how often they can be moved? Like, does moving the portables create um, a shorter lifespan for them? This is one of the niche uh, aspects why this manufacturer is, 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 has control over this market because they've engineered it such that we can move them and, and put them together multiple times without affecting the service life of the portables. And so that's one of the reasons why they control this market. And as a follow-up, I'm wondering, um, they move them? Do we, like, do we also... Um, have an increased cost in, on the budget line to move them, and is it this company that actually has that niche market? Through the chair. So unfortunately, it's another contractor that has the shareholds of the moving of the portables. Uh, NRB uh, are too busy with um, making them, uh, so there's another company in southwestern Ontario that also specializes in moving portables. Um, and uh, they also control the market quite considerably as well. The budget line? Um, so with the moves as well, that's uh, taken care of out of uh, uh, several lines. One is an operation line that's in the capital projects group and then through also the temporary accommodations grant. Any other questions of trustees in this uh, second round? Uh, Trustee Raman, and then I'll move to uh, Trustee Pizzolatto. Thank you, and through you. Um, two questions. My, one question is related to port -a packs just so that I understand kind of the difference. Is there a cost benefit at all to port -a packs 
through the chair. So uh, portal packs uh, would be more of a long-term temporary accommodation measure. Um, they're quite costly to move. Um, I kind of call them like IKEA furniture, where it it's only you can only move them and put them together so many times, just because <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot more moving parts to them. So it's more of a long-term accommodation measure. Uh, thank you. Um, and second, on the port pack piece, how do we make a decision as to whether or not a school will get a port pack through, through the chair, that's uh, it'd be more of a, a part of a, a planning exercise. Uh, so, as an example, as part of our capital priority submission with Eagle Heights. Um, uh, because the ministry was looking at modular construction and um, and different techniques, um, we sized the dish in such that we would keep the porta pack on site. Um, so it's really a unique uh, school by school school basis where um, senior administration would review um, what the medium to long term implications would be of purchasing a porta pack, uh, because uh, you're essentially purchasing six to eight or ten portables at one shot. Trustee Pizzolatto, do you have uh, questions? I have two questions. Go ahead. Um, the, temporary, the temporary accommodation grant from the government for 2019-2020, how many portable um, could we purchase from that grant? Uh, through the chair, so approximately eight portables, uh, but we also rely on that grant for our summer portable moves. And a second question, Trustee Pizzolatto? Yes. Um, why wouldn't we spend our accumulated surplus on additions we're in schools that are needed rather than portable? Uh, good question. Um, the ministry ultimately controls uh, major capital uh, projects uh, whereby uh, we submit them through the capital priority process and they determine whether or not um, they would approve them or not. Um, so whether it's our own money or the ministry's money, if the ministry says no, um, we don't see that as a viable project. Um, you have excess capacity in other schools in the area um, and say no, they wouldn't then turn around and say, but yeah, you can use your own board money. Um, so, so they really have a very uh, tight process and control over our capital spend. So the one planning accommodation tool that we have is temporary accommodation and portables, and, and that's one thing that you know they do allow. However, they did tighten uh, up uh, how boards can use funding um, in this past September uh, when they restricted boards from being able to use school renewal dollars to purchase uh, portables. We're learning okay. less tonight. Uh, I will now uh, move to the third round. I will, uh, I will allow questions only if the question has not been asked uh, previous. So new questions. And then I will look to uh, Trustee McKinnon to move on the seconder of the motion and we can enter debate. Uh, Trustee Hunt. So is any of this allotment um, that you're requesting approval for from surplus going to be used to move existing portables? No. So will this cost cover the move, removal of if there are replacements? We recently auctioned or RFP'd to remove portables from some of our schools. Um, what does that look like when we remove them? Are there costs to remove them? And do So if we are to decommission a portable, then we would RFP for the sell of that portable. And then part of the RFP would be for whoever is purchasing it is their responsibility for taking it from our site. Hmm. So it's basically, it doesn't cost us anything. We would uh, either, they would either pay us or it would be a, a no cost. Just to add to that, typically um, there's, it's not school boards, but there's other organizations um, that uh, have a quite an interest in buying 40 year old portables to use uh, up in north uh, for various camps or different things so there is a use but typically when we sell them they're not um, allocated to other school boards uh, due to their age 
final question? Could you use more money? Should, should we be looking at, could we leverage, make a bigger buy, have more influence with the supplier to be able to in, invest more money in replacing some of our portables at this time? Um, so I think what we're trying to do um, as senior administration is uh, try to be as fiscally prudent as possible with using a cumulative surplus because there are some other implications with respect to, to using this until we have further information in the spring. Um, with respect to economies of scale, um, NRB doesn't really operate that way. Uh, it's a unit rate cost per portable. So if we purchase 50 or 100, it'll still be the same, the same value. So um, we feel comfortable with the ask uh, at this point. Any other questions? Trustee Pizzolatto, do you have another question before I close questions? No, I'm good, thanks. Thank you. I will then look towards uh, Trustee McKinnon, who uh, moved the motion that the Thames Valley District School Board procure 25 portables from R sorry, NRB Inc. at an estimated cost of 3.1 million appropriated from accumulated surplus to fund the cost of portables. Do I have a seconder for that motion, Trustee Smith? I'll open the floor to uh, debate. There any uh, debate? Is there any debate or comments related to the motion that is now on the floor? Trustee Skinner. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, so, number one, I think this is a, a critical need. It needs, and yeah, this is an important um, expense that we, we need to make. Um, just like going back at the report and looking at the portable inventory, um, it's interesting to notice that over the past few years that the need for portables has increased. So you see we, we've, we've needed 28, 20, we're looking at 25 more. And I think that's an indication to us that there's a problem in distribution, that we have overutilized schools and underutilized schools. And I think, you know, the, I don't like the idea of spending money on, on portables. And um, I'm hoping that if we can solve some of the distribution problem, that that will save us, uh, you know, costs in terms of replacing our aging inventory. So just, just you know, just a, a calculation off the top of my head, if we're going to replace the 153 portables, uh, that's like $19 million. And, you know, so there, poof, there goes our, our, our surplus. It's gone completely. And I don't think we want to be in that sort of position. But I think for tonight, this is an important decision um, that we need to uh, vote in favor of. Um, but looking forward, I think that we need to um, look at the accommodation review. And I think that's very important in terms of limiting the amount of money we need to spend to replace that aging inventory. So. Thank you, Trustee Skinner. Any other speakers to the motion that's on the floor before I call the question? Trustee Pizzolatto, would you like to speak to the motion before I call the vote on this uh, motion? Yeah, I agree with, um, with Trustee Skinner. I would like to see um, bond reviews and accommodation reviews before um, buying more portables and spending our surplus because I think our surplus can be set, spent in in better areas. Thank you, Trustee uh, Pizzolatto. Seeing no other speakers to the motion, I'll call the question. All in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion is carried. Thank you. Moving along in our agenda, uh, English Kindergarten 12D, English Kindergarten in French Immersion Schools application process. Let me shuffle through my papers here. Uh, Superintendent Moynihan. Good evening. I'm, just, I'm joined this evening by Andrea Marlowe, our Diversity and Equity Coordinator. We are pleased to provide you with an update with respect to the application process for English Kindergarten and Designated French Immersion Schools. Last December, the Board of Trustees approved a motion to provide English Kindergarten programming in Designated French Immersion Schools to address the use of purpose-built space in a fiscally responsible manner. Due to space limitations, the maximum number of classes to be offered at each of the approved sites was capped, as indicated in the Board report. As you may be aware, the Thames Valley District, through our, through our website and social media, 
Registration window for the kindergarten is January 20th through February 7th, 2020. In the event that the desire for enrollment in the English kindergarten and French immersion schools exceeds our space availability, we have developed an application process in order to ensure equitable access to the limited number of spaces. In an effort to ensure that we have a space in our board for each of our kindergarten students, all students must first register in their kindergarten at, at the designated English language school. All registrants who declare an intention to register for French immersion in grade one are provided with an application form for the English kindergarten program in their designated French immersion school, if desired. Application forms will be sent electronically to French immersion elementary schools after the close of the kindergarten registration period. Principals of designated French immersion schools will meet with a system review committee after the close of registration to consider all applications for the English language kindergarten program. The committee and principals will identify any applicants who qualify for priority admission based on exceptional medical or other support needs and select all other applicants using a digital random selection process to fill all remaining program placements, respecting agreed upon class sizes and ensuring a balanced ratio of K1 and K2 students in each classroom where possible. Principals of French Immersion Elementary Schools will communicate admission decisions in writing to parents and guardians and to home English language schools on or before April 1st, 2020. Our year one kindergarten students or K-1 students admitted to the program will be given priority for admission to K-2 as space permits if their parents or guardians wish for them to continue in this program. All applicants whose random selection does not afford them a placement due to space limitations will remain registered at the designated English language school and be placed on a waiting list for the English language program at the designated French immersion school according to the position already assigned through the random selection process. We have posted frequently asked questions and responses to the Thames Valley website and would like to touch on a few items at this time. Thank you and through the chair. Good evening everyone. The frequently asked questions document that we've posted on the website um, addresses some questions um, and anticipates some questions that we may have about the process. So I'm just going to highlight a few things and then, and then we're happy to, of course, answer questions about this process. So the first question that you have in the uh, document um, speaks to the enrollment limitations. So there we've clearly laid out the limitations at each school um, based on the enrollment cap of 26 students. Um, uh, and you see the limitations by school according to the classrooms available. The second question addresses um, the issue of which school uh, a student may apply to attend. So the, what we want to emphasize there is that we will not be accepting applications from students to a school that is not their designated French immersion school. Um, so the application must be to the designated school based on the student's home address. The third question addresses the uh, issue of sibling priority. And what we wanted to emphasize here um, was the fact that senior administration um, had looked at this issue very carefully um, and had undertaken to uh, review it from both a legal perspective and a policy perspective. Um, and had determined that providing priority to siblings would create inequality of access to the program. Um, and, uh, you know, this is most evident where in certain circumstances there is extremely limited uh, space available. And in those situations, providing priority to siblings um, would re severely restrict access to other students who are, are not siblings. Um, and in some circumstances would actually completely deny access to the program to those students. So, so based on that, that thorough review um, and uh, the research that was undertaken, uh, the decision was made that the admission process or the application process would be uh, based on um, a random selection. Uh, and it's uh, a process that does make uh, an exception for students who have a demonstrated uh, medical or other support need. So um, anticipating you know, some uh, questions about what that means exactly, we can provide an example um, 
of, for example, a student with uh, mobility challenges who uh, requires, who is in a wheelchair, or who, who requires an accessible school, and where that student's home English school is not accessible, um, but that student has demonstrated or, or has indicated an intention to, or their family has indicated an intention for that student to attend French immersion in grade one, um, we would therefore consider it an exceptional circumstance and we would be looking at um, prioritizing uh, ap ad admission of that student to the French Immersion School. So it's an exceptional circumstance uh, category and, and it's that category, it's only that category that would not uh, be entered, that category of student that would not be entered into the random selection. Uh, so this this is the process that the administration has determined to be uh, consistent with the board's commitments to equity and inclusion, and also a, a process that is uh, procedurally fair in the circumstances. Finally, I just wanted to highlight the uh, question, question number eight, that speaks to transportation. So uh, anticipating that question, we just wanted to confirm that yes, in fact, transportation will be provided to students attending English kindergarten in French immersion schools, provided that they meet the eligibility criteria um, for transportation. Thank you, Andrea. With that, we'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, I'll open the floor to questions. Uh, Trustee Skinner and then uh, Trustee Polhill. Thank you, um, through you, Chair. Um, this is just a question about the sibling preference. So if, if all FDK is going to be um, instructed in English, then I don't understand how providing sibling preference would, would result in a lack of access to French immersion because there's only one entry point, that's grade one. So, and one of the reasons, the reason why I ask this question is because one of the reasons why I supported um, this proposal was because for logistical reasons and to make it more convenient for families who already had siblings at the school. So I'm trying to understand the, the equity argument. I don't, <coughs> in my mind it doesn't hold water because um, grade one entry is open to everybody and everybody's going to be getting um, FDK instruction in English. Thank you, I'll, I'll do my best to answer that question um, through the chair. So the equity argument relates only to the English kindergarten program in the FI school. So, so this is a specific program that we're speaking about. It's not, the equity argument doesn't apply to French immersion generally. We know that that program uh, as an optional program is open to everyone. Um, the equity argument relates only to the limited spaces available for the English kindergarten program situated in French immersion schools. So in those circumstances where we have uh, many more applications or much more interest in the English kindergarten program uh, at a French immersion school than we have spaces, if we were to populate those spaces solely uh, with, or if we were to prioritize applications from siblings, younger siblings of students already enrolled in the French immersion program at that school, we could, uh, uh, based on, on the numbers, um, populate all of those spaces with siblings, which means that we're not moving out of the priority category and into a general category that is open to everyone. So if I'm a student who is not a younger sibling, I effectively have no option or no, uh, that I have no access to that specific program of English kindergarten. So I hope, I hope that clarifies it a little bit. A follow up, Trustee Skinner. That, that clarifies for me. I just, um, you know, I, I don't understand um, what the legal, what the legal concerns are because we're not barring children or students from receiving English instruction. I mean, every, every, every student in FDK is going to be instructed in English, that's the decision. So I'm concerned that we've narrowed the scope so much and the, the intent behind, um, I know it ju I'm just speaking for myself, but the rationale that I had for supporting the proposal was that it would provide um, convenience for parents in terms of logistics. But. 
Trustee Pullhill? I'm wondering if you can provide a little bit more or maybe some examples of what random selection means. Does it mean like a big machine that rolls tickets around or is it a program we're using? What does it mean? Through the chair, we are working in collaboration with our research and assessment department and they, once we know the number of applicants for both the K-1 and K-2 um, components of that that kindergarten class in each school for each of the classes, then they will generate random numbers. So for example, if there were 100 applicants, they're able to enter uh, formulas into spreadsheets for us that randomly, that randomize those numbers one through 100, and they would be different for both the K-1 and the K-2, as well as each subsequent class within that school, as well as for all the other classes in, in the, where we have the English programming. So it is, it is ultimately very random and there's no um, influence other than the computer generating all those numbers one through 100 in a random order. Follow up or second question, go ahead. Um, so when you say K1, K, K2, I feel like we have just all day kindergarten. Um, we don't have like a junior and a senior. So I, what do you mean by K1 and K2 in this instance? And, because I only get one, two questions. And, ex like, are we going to be allowing kids just this time to enter into the K2 program? N after this coming year, everybody else will sort of be, if somebody from K1 doesn't go into the second year, they, then not, there'll be an opening in a wait list. I'll try to answer both of your questions. If I forget other one, please remind me. Um, K1 and K2 are the new, new terms, or kindergarten year one for JK and kindergarten year two for, for, for senior kindergarten. So the same type of thing. It is a two-year program. Mm -hmm. With respect to this year, we anticipate this will be our um, largest entry point because with the classes that have been defined, we need to fill all those classes, that I hope to fill those classes, with the K-1 and K-2 applicants, uh, an equal number in each class. So for example, a class of 26 would have 13 K-1 students and 13 K-2 students in it. Um, you are correct in that um, next a year from now, those K-2 students, if desired by the parents, would move on to grade one French immersion or return to their home English school. And the K-1 students would move up to K-2, if that's the desire of the parents to continue, and we would be filling with new K-1 students as well as any spaces that had been created by families relocating or withdrawing from the program. So we'll maintain a waiting list throughout the year in case that those relocations occur, but similarly when we move forward the next year, if there are open spaces, those students would fill as well. Um, the waiting list though will only be for the current school year. So if, uh, if a parent applies for their child to attend in K-1 this year, and through the random selection process, they are, are not admitted and they're placed on the waiting list. If they're not, um, if they remain on the waiting list and they still wish to be considered for K-2, they would need to reapply for K-2. And that will be communicated to them when they get the results of the admission process. And the reason for that reapplication process is because <coughs> we may have some families that make um, alternate decisions in a year's time. They may decide that they don't wish to continue in this program and it's not their intent to continue on in French immersion once the child reaches the grade one age. Can, can I just expand my question a little bit? Because I, I, I understand how we're going to be addressing the new kindergarten registrants. What's the, you're, we're talking about, we're going to select K-1 and we're gonna select K-2. How, how do those K-2 kids find out about this? Because yeah, it's my understanding that when the K-1 kids register, then it's going to pop up and say, do you plan on going to French Immersion? Well, what about the, the K-2? Like, are they going to be I guess, less informed? All of our elementary principals <coughs> received um, uh, standardized documentation. We're asking them, asking them to submit or give out to their current K-1 students the fact that there are these opportunities in their designated French immersion school. So that if it's their intent for their child to eventually attend grade one French immersion, they will have received notification that this is a possibility 
and uh, then asked to contact the office if they would like this application form. So all of our, our newcomers into our system, new students into our system, as well as the current K-1 students should have full knowledge of this process. I have Trustee Roman and then Trustee Hunt. Trustee Roman. Thank you and through you, Chair. Um, so I had two questions related again to the equity and priority question. So one of the things that I'm still trying to figure out is how in the sec, so when they, uh, they were in K-1, now they're implying in K-2, we can give priority to them based on the fact that they were already there for K-1. To that me, is that's correct. To me, that's where I get lost on the equity argument because uh, now I'm understanding it differently as they're now being given preference because they were already there. <coughs> and similarly, we're trying to remove any preferences or, or potential issues that would create inequity. Do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Through the chair, the reason that they would be given preference from going from K-1 to K-2 is the intent of this program is it's the parents desire for their child to eventually participate in grade one French immersion. And so they are in K-1 through the random selection process. They weren't prioritized because of a sibling, for example. So a random selection process open to all of the students. And since they're there, then they would be given priority in K-2 for that smooth transition. Sorry, thank you. Um, my second question relates to the, uh, let's say a parent chooses not to put their child into K-1 and their desire is for their child to be in K-2 uh, at, at their French immersion school, but in English. Um, so from my understanding of the Q&A, they would not be able to be eligible for K-2 because they didn't go to their feeder school for K-1. Is that correct? Through the process and applying for K-2, so they would make the application for K-2 in their designated French immersion school, as long as they applied, um, and it, um, it's, it's just like starting school at that point, if they didn't get in for K-2 at the beginning, they still do need to attend K-2 in their English school. So we're suggesting that they need to be in school, attending school in order to come into the K-2 program. I'll answer your question. So I think you're saying if they, don't get in in K-1 and they decide not to enter into our system, then the, the next year what they would do is follow the same process. So they would just register at their English school for K-2 and put their name back into the draw for random selection the next year. Okay, Trustee Hunt. Um, if it so happens that we don't fill all the FDK spaces at Louise Arbor, and you happen to be within walking distance of that school and don't require transportation, would we not grant an out an area of, out of area exemption? Through the chair, our current process would indicate that these classes are for children that do plan to attend French immersion. And therefore, the, the motion that went forward in December was that was to be the maximum number of classes at each school. So for a school, for example, you mentioned Louise Arbor is designated to have four, up to four classes of English kindergarten students who plan to go on to French immersion. Um, there's nothing that um, suggests that we must have uh, the, th the four classes if there is not interest in families who wish for English kindergarten in that school moving into French immersion. So we would not need to fill it. And that would, our current process with the attendance area would be, that would be um, an out of area request. And um, typically with our process, there would need to have been a concern as to why the family could not attend their designated home English school. And that typically does not happen in the early years. A follow up or a second question, Trustee Hunt? Um, more of a comment. I'm, I'm seeing this, you know, I, I think as we look at challenges with portables and with empty space and what we can do, we need to, we need to look and think about our flexibility in this policy because we're not utilizing the spaces we have and it's, a, it's just a comment generally. And this could be an example where we can draw parents from other areas. They could be 
quickly adjusting pressures, but if we're going to never, you know, the default on the side of never granting out of area exemptions, we're never going to realize that opportunity. Uh, Trustee Smith, I have you next on the list. Thank you. I just wanted to echo Trustee Skinner's comments. Uh, sometimes I think our policies are, are made in London, and in London the cars go by at about 50 kilometers an hour, they're, at least they're supposed to, but out in the country on my road, they're going by at 100 kilometers an hour, and the ladies are standing out there with one, ch one child in arms and a couple of little kids with them, and if they have to stand out there longer because the kids are going to two different schools, I don't think it's a very safe thing. So I, I think we should consider uh, that if a child has a sibling that's already in French immersion, that perhaps that's an indication that they really are headed towards uh, French immersion. Because anybody could say they are. Thank you, Trustee Smith. Uh, any other questions before I look towards uh, Trustee Pizzolatto? Seeing none, Trustee Pizzolatto, do you have any questions related to the report on uh, English kindergarten in French immersion schools? No, I don't have any. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no additional questions, thank you very much for bringing this information to us this evening. We'll move along in our agenda to uh, agenda item 13, reports from board committees. We'll begin with the Special Education Advisory Committee and I'll look towards uh, Trustee Yeoman. Thank you, Chair, and through you, um, our last <coughs> SEAC meeting was January the 7th from approximately 12.30 till 2.30. As usual, we had some excellent updates and discussions, some of which were the exclusion of student procedure, the review of the draft policy for the student use of guide dogs and service animals, the standing items of students on modified day and special education plan. Um, all the details are in our package. Thank you, Trustee Yeoman. Any questions related to the Special Education Advisory Committee of January the 7th? Wonderful, thank you. We'll move on to the Program and School Services Committee of January the 7th and Trustee Yeoman. Um, can we go to the next one and then come back to this one, please? Absolutely. Uh, we'll move on to C, Chair's Committee of January the 14th, Trustee Ruddock. Thank you. Uh, so we met as a committee on January the 14th from approximately 3 o'clock until 4.42. Information was shared by Director Fisher um, and he reviewed a handout regarding the French Immersion Communication Plan. Uh, this information has since been shared with trustees. Uh, financial implications on all trustee reports. Uh, the report template was reviewed and will be updated to take um, cost savings and rep to replace cost savings with the wording of financial implications. And thirdly, Director Fisher also brought forward um, the idea of potentially hosting one board meeting a year in the, the, out in the community, so and kind of rotating around between the three counties and whatnot. It was a good meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee uh, Trustee Ruddock. Any questions related to Chair's Committee of January fourteenth? <coughs> I have two questions. Okay, one, one, okay, go ahead, Trustee Pizzolatto. I also had Trustee Skinner and uh, Trustee Bennett. So go ahead, Trustee Pizzolatto. Um, uh, number seven, Trustee Forum. Can we have a Trustee um, Forum discussion placed on an advisory committee or an input survey sent out to all trustees? Absolutely, we'll take that question to Chair's committee and We can take that to okay, chair's committee and schedule it to one of our advisory committee meetings. Thank you. I have a question for 12. Do you want me to wait? Just uh, number 12, certainly go ahead. 
Um, there was discussion on this. Is this going to come back at a uh, committee meeting or are dates being set? Uh, we've just had some initial discussion and it will come back over time. Yes. Okay. Uh, Trustee Skinner. Uh, yes, just uh, two questions. The first question is about the off-site meeting. Will that be a decision that comes to the Board of Trustees? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just brought this suggestion as a consideration to the Chair's Committee to see if the Chair's Committee Chair's had committee. support to bring it forward for here for decision. And basically the suggestion would be to designate one meeting a year, potentially November, sometime when the weather would be better, and just go on a rotation schedule. So this year we would have it in Oxford County, the next year in Elegant County, maybe the next year in our Indigenous community, next year in Middlesex. So just rotate that through so that over the course of your term you'd have at least one meeting in every part of the board. And so that, would, that was the suggestion for consideration, which would, will come here for decision. Through our bylaws, it would, it's required to come here for board decision. <coughs> question uh, second question I don't know if it's this item or I think uh, yeah I believe it is somewhere in here it talks about um, spending money to replace the computer and printer in the trustee lounge is that this report I you know I I just um, is that going to be a decision that comes to the Board of Trustees as well uh, generally it's a decision that's made by uh, chairs committee and we would look to our budget relative to if there is a, um, a budget line and funding relative to uh, to the budget uh, budget line for a purchase of an updated uh, printer that would have Wi-Fi capabilities is the conversations that we've that we've had and so through you, Chair. Um, is this something that's uh, supported in our board bylaws to make that decision at chairs rather than by the board? Um, that's a good question. We'd have to go back and uh, look to our bylaws for direction. Um, trustee, did I see another hand up for questions related to uh, Trustee Bennett? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, under item 15, other business, um, could I, two things. Um, under A, could I have um, an explanation? And under B, does that mean a process for agenda revisions? Does that refer to the chair's committee agenda or other agenda revisions? I will start with uh, trustee regrets for a meeting. So as an, um, when trustees uh, send regrets to corporate services to meetings, we kindly asked that uh, through corporate services, they could let the chair of that meeting know who, would they, who they could expect or who would uh, not be in attendance at, um, at their meetings, advisory committee meetings, um, as well as board, um, board meetings. And, and especially related to ensuring that we have quorum at our both board and our advisory committee meetings. And I'm seeing nodding of the heads of um, those who are in attendance at the meeting. And then um, B was uh, an item that had been brought to our attention relative to oftentimes we will see our agendas in, um, in advance of the meeting and then we will receive our agenda and paper copy with the word revised on it. And our question was just, our discussion was related to if we could be informed what the revisions of the agenda are related to the first agenda that we would see and then the agenda that we would receive at our meetings. Any other questions related to the Chair's committee um, agenda, or, or sorry, Chair's committee report, or is there a follow-up, Trustee Bennett? Welcome. Any other questions related to the Chair's committee agenda? Seeing none, we go back to uh, program and school services, Trustee Yeoman. <clears throat> through you chair and thank you very much for the delay as a new chair I forgot that I do have to report on this so I appreciate your understanding um, our meeting was January the 7th at uh, 6 p.m. 
Um, we are very pleased to welcome uh, Lorianne Pizzolato as uh, the Vice Chair of this committee, and that election occurred during this meeting. Um, there were operational plan updates in numeracy and equity um, given by senior administration for our behalf, and also an update on the implementation of the operational plan. Thank you, Trustee Yeoman. Any questions related to the Program and School Services Advisory Committee? Seeing none, we'll move along in our agenda to D, Planning and Priorities Advisory Committee report. Trustee Yeoman. Raman. Raman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, so for the Planning and Priorities Advisory Committee that took place on January 14th, uh, thank you to Trustee Cuddy for uh, uh, coming on board as the Vice Chair for that committee. Uh, we were able to take a look at the 2020-2021 preliminary budget documents, as well as the budget calendar. Uh, we also participated in an engagement session uh, related to the accommodation planning of which uh, results and feedback will be coming to us um, in subsequent meetings. Um, and we also dealt with an in-camera matter in that meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Rahman. Any questions related to the Planning and Priorities Advisory Committee? Seeing none. Thank you. We'll move to Committee of the Whole in camera. Trustee Ruddock. Thank you. Uh, so we met in camera, uh, Committee of the Whole, January the 28th. The committee met in camera from 5 o'clock until 526, and we discussed confidential negotiation and personnel matters. Uh, no conflicts of interest were declared. And the motion approved at the in-camera session of January the 28th related to personal matters uh, was approved. Thank you, Trustee Ruddock. You're moving that motion. I'll look for a seconder of the motion. Trustee Hunt, all in favor? Motion of the in-camera is carried. Moving along in our agenda, trustee update from external committees, Ontario Public School Boards Association, uh, Trustee Skinner. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, so we just were at uh, PEZ on the weekend, and we received uh, exceptional training. And one of the themes of that training, I would say, was leadership. And uh, one of the emphasis, emphasis um, within that context was the value of having locally elected trustees who are able to uh, bring parent voice to uh, governance and, and budget decisions. And uh, what we're seeing is that across the entire country and in other jurisdictions, uh, the increasing um, appreciation for trustees and, and the roles that they, uh, they fulfill. And that's my report. Thank you, Trustee Skinner. Any uh, questions from trustees related to the OPSPA report? The conference was attended by many of us and uh, Director uh, Fisher and Associate Director uh, Culhane also joined us. It was a wonderful learning and networking opportunity. We'll move along then to Thames Valley Education Foundation report. Uh, Trustee McKinnon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And through you, I have the pleasure to bring this month's uh, report. Uh, this year kicks off the 10th year of the Caring Fund, and we're very proud of the Thames Valley Education Foundation to be holding a celebration here at the board office on February 11th at 10 o'clock. All trustees and of course senior and mid are invited to uh, celebrate 10 years of the good work that the Education Foundation Caring Fund is doing. Our annual AGM is coming up on February 19th at 4 p.m. Of course, once again, everybody is invited. If you'd like to attend, we'd love to have you. It's always a great day vote in the slate of candidates, right, Mr. Skinner? <laughs> uh, so uh, the Caring Fund this year, uh, from November the 13th to January the 7th, there were 126 requests for $36,000, and that compares to 87 requests last year and $29,000 granted in that same time frame. Uh, we were talking about our Kids Helping Kids concert that was going to be held on February the 20th. We now have a new date for that. It, it's a tentative date, so we will let you know once we get closer. Hopefully, it will be April the 16th at uh, 
uh, Lester B. Pearson uh, School of the Arts. Uh, the lottery is going very well uh, for anybody who's in it, the 50-50. I now know they have, they've had two draws, and it's increasing every uh, draw, so thank you very much to our staff for participating. And I'd be happy to accept, uh, answer any questions. Any questions related to the Thames Valley Education Foundation report? Seeing none, we'll move along in our agenda to communications. We've received a letter from Autism Ontario London related to membership to the Special Education Advisory Committee. There is a uh, recommendation in the letter. I'll read that and look for a mover and a seconder of this recommendation that Kelly Wilson be appointed to the Special Education Advisory Committee is an alternate for the remainder of the 2018 December 1st to 2019 November 30th, 2022 um, term. I'll look for a mover, Trustee Roman and a seconder. Uh, Trustee Yeoman, all in favor? Thank you. Motion is um, carried. Um, notice of motion, uh, none, and notice of motion which has been given, none. We'll move to agenda item 18, questions and comments by members. <coughs> Trustee Skinner and then Trustee Smith. Thank you and through you, Chair. Uh, my question revolves around the um, Wuhan, Wuhan uh, novel cor coronavirus. And I just wanted to um, get an indication of, of what we're doing just for, uh, for the public to know. It might be good to mention in this meeting. And also, um, I wanted to ask the que question um, in terms of how this compares to um, SARS, like when, when we had that, and what actions were taken by the board at that time? And I'll just leave it at that for now. And I, I, have a, I do have another question, but I'll ask it after. For sure. Thank you for the question, Trustee Skinner. On Sunday, I participated in a teleconference with uh, Dr. Williams, who's the uh, Chief Medical Health Officer for the province of Ontario. And we also connected with Dr. Teresa Tam, Canada's Chief Public Health Officer. And so according to both of those uh, doctors, the risk to Canadians remains low for the coronavirus. There are three key messages that when we're dealing with this, we need to stick to the facts. We need to listen to the health professionals and take our direction from them, and we need to remain calm. Public health officials suggest all Canadians take regular health precautions to protect themselves against respiratory illnesses such as extensive washing of hands, etc. There is a special website that has been created that is updated every day for parents and guardians to find important information about how to protect yourself and how to recognize possible symptoms and what to do if you feel ill and we have shared that information with our community as well as that letter from Dr. Williams. Uh, we'll continue to monitor and continue to be in touch with the uh, Ministry of Education and the Health Departments. A couple of comparisons to SARS. SARS was an airborne contagion. This is not. This is a surface-borne contagion. Also, the infrastructure for response for the various units is much more advanced than it was 20 years ago. As far as I am aware today, there has been no single case of spread in Canada. The three, I think, identified cases are all people that have traveled to the Wuhan province. Um, we have to recognize that over 4,000 people fly in and out of Pearson to China every day. Uh, so this is something that is uh, uh, something that has not been curtailed at this stage. Wuhan province itself, or Wuhan and that province itself has been completely quarantined. There are no quarantine cases here and there is no recommendation for quarantine. So if anyone is feeling any issue, uh, of a respiratory nature, which could be, there's apparently two f strains of flu going around, pneumonia going around, and something they're calling the 60-day cough. So any of these respiratory issues are to, you are to report directly to uh, a medical professional or the public health and be checked out and then take all precautions from there. And so that, uh, I hope, answers your question. Thank you, um, and, and through you, Chair. Thank, thank you for that response. I appreciate that. Um, so as a precaution, I wonder whether or not um, we can increase our communications in terms of, of uh, you know, 
the proper steps that we should be taking, like hand washing and that sort of thing. Um, I, you know, I just wonder whether or not that can't be something that we could do as a precaution. I don't, I don't think that um, it would cost us anything to to look at doing that sort of thing, but it might be something at this time where it makes sense to emphasize it, <coughs> not just for uh, you know the coronavirus, but for the other. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly open to that suggestion, and I think working, uh, Richard can take care of that. We can certainly share some of those recommended steps. We have that information, and certainly we can uh, send that out through school messenger or school websites. And I, I think you're right. The more information that people have, the better prepared we are to, to deal with that, because I know, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation that is circulating. Thank you for that, Trustee Skinner. Trustee Smith? I wonder if Trustee Skinner said he had two questions. Were those the two questions, or do you have yet another one? Okay, thank you. You absolutely can. You heard that we have two citizens of the year in this room. And I, I must tell you that in the Elmer Express, uh, there's a political cartoonist and he had lots of fun with Megan and I during the, the, the last work. At one point, he had us trying to pull a rabbit out of a hat. And then at another point, he had, uh, he had us jumping out of a jack-in-the-box, which uh, Jeff Yurick was the guy working at the wheel. And then uh, another time, we became the elves on the roof of Springfield School and all this sort of thing. So his name is Ron Allen. And um, I asked Ron for the original of the art of our trustee Ruddick jumping out of the box. And he gave me that. And so I framed it for you. So this is for you. So you can share with your friends. This is for, for my partner. I'm very proud of her. And, and he signed it on the back. I, he must have been an elementary school kid or something. Anyway, so I made a little window on the back so you can so you can see his signature there. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Any other questions or comments by members? It's a hard act to follow. <laughs> News from the system then, Director Fisher. Thank you, Chair Morrell. I always like the opportunity to close our meetings, celebrating the great things that are happening in our district. So our first example is some student achievement in mathematics at Annandale Public School in Oxford County, where we see grade three students uh, identifying and describing polygons both orally and in writing. And we know how important that connection between literacy and numeracy is. And then, then, then students are using the math language in order to guess each other's mystery shape. Our next slide is Davenport Public School in Elgin County, where we see grade four students improving their mental multiplication skills, applying their knowledge to a math game. So actually learning the foundations, but then having opportunity to apply those foundations in a real world context, which is always helpful. We move on to literacy. We see Centennial Public School in Middlesex County, grade st students from grades two and three, opening pen pal letters that they have received from seniors who live at the Mount Hope long-term facility long-term care facility. Students were excited to read the letters together in a class and have already written the letters back to that facility. Also in literacy, we see Elgin Court Public School in Elgin County, and students decided to ditch their desks for the day and take part in a guided reader, reading exercise on the floor. And so it's always important for kids not to sit too long, so we like to see the opportunities to move around. Equity diversity, we have a great example at Parkview Public School in Middlesex County on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Great students from grades five and six learned that we all can be leaders, that all of us have the ability to affect change, and that we can all spread love and combat hatred, which is always a good message for all of our students. Moving on to Sir Wilfrid Laurier Secondary School in London. We celebrated student voice as grade nine geography students recently demonstrated understanding and gratitude with letters to Autumn Peltier. Uh, the Chief Water Commissioner and a Woman of Influence. For relationships, we have J.P. Robarts Public School in London, and we uh, want to congratulate students uh, at that public school who took home first place in the CBC 2019 Canadian Music Class Challenge in the elementary vocal category. Most of the students are between grade four, five, and six, with a few select members from grades seven and eight, and they rehearse every day during their nutrition break. So congratulations to the students of J.P. Robarts. 
Also, we have College Avenue Secondary School in Woodstock. We see leadership from students at the school as they welcome families and students into the Grade 8 Parent Information Night, which helped to explain all the amazing programs, clubs, and activities to prospective students and their families to hopefully increase our enrollment uh, at our schools. And that is uh, our news from the system for January. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions related to uh, learning about all the exciting things that are happening in our schools? Seeing none, thank you. It always is a wonderful way to ground us in terms of why we're here and what we do. I will then uh, look for a motion to adjourn. Trustee Smith and seconded by Trustee Hunt, all in favor? Have a wonderful evening, everyone. <laughs>